So I'm Rachel Andrew. Those are some places you can find more about me. I will be posting these slides later. I'll give you a link at the end where you can get all the demo code and things that I'll be showing you because we're going fairly quickly through some examples. So I've been working with CSS since CSS really became a thing, since it first appeared in browsers. I've been doing this for that long. And with that kind of history, CSS today is absolutely amazing. We can do a whole heap of stuff that for an awful long time we could only do with JavaScript or by you know, using a whole stack of sliced up images. But CSS for layout seemed to get itself stuck somewhere in about 2006. And essentially we're using CSS for layout at the moment that was never designed to be used for complex full page application layout and that hurts us. A show of hands, who here is generally using some kind of framework, bootstrap, foundation or so on for grid stuff, for layout? Exactly. And so we view source on the web and we see this. And I know it's possible to not do this by using SAS or whatever, but if you view source on a lot of bootstrap sites, you will see this in the markup. And what we're doing here is we are describing layout in markup. And whether you care or you don't care about semantic class names, this is conceptually very heavy. And it makes it hard to do things like add new breakpoints you know, for, small, for small viewports or whatever, or just to add little tweaks. It's quite difficult because we're doing this in our markup. But we're doing this because layout is hard and it is fragile and we have business goals to meet. We can't just spend all day playing around with CSS. So our existing layout methods, they are costing us and they're costing us developer hours as we're all learning how to do this stuff. They're coming at a cost of being able to order our documents in fully semantic ways. Source order still matters an awful lot. And they come at a cost of us leaning on frameworks to deal with complexity and math. We're adding markup to our documents. We're leaning on preprocessors and, and to abstract away these problems. But there is hope. And it comes in the form of a group of modules that are going to redefine how we do layout on the web. And these are Flexbox, CSS Grid Layout, and the Box Alignment module. These are our new system for doing layout on the web. And when we talk about these new modules, we tend to talk in terms of how they solve our problems. And the reason that they solve these problems is that they share some characteristics. They're characteristics that our existing layout methods do not have. They properly separate document source order and visual display. They give us true alignment control. They give us the ability to center things horizontally and vertically. They're responsive by default. They remove the need to calculate percentages to make columns fit. And most importantly, they give elements relationship to each other in the context of an overall layout. And this is really important. Because a lot of the problems we have with our existing layout methods is because items in the layout do not understand that the other items in the layout exist. If I float two blocks left and right, and the left one is shorter than the right one, I've got no way to tell the left-hand block that it should visually extend to the height of the right-hand one, because it doesn't know it's there. It doesn't know how tall it is. We've been trying to create full-height columns for years. Maybe some people here might remember the faux columns technique, using a vertically tiled background image to create the illusion of a full height column. And these are the techniques that are kind of stock in trade for the web developer. And they have been for years, and they really started to fall apart when responsive came along. This idea of relationship is why people jumped on the idea of display table. We turned elements into a CSS table, and that gave them relationship, because table, elements in a table do have relationship to each other. And that's why that kind of work to do things like full height columns. So Flexbox and Grid take this idea of relationship, and they really run with it. And that's where a lot of their power starts. So here's Flexbox. Those full height columns, that's pretty much the basic behavior of Flexbox and Grid. So we've got a simple Flexbox example here. We're taking advantage of the initial default values of the Flex properties. Our sidebar and our content are inside a Flex container. 
and the sidebar runs to the height of the content. The background color goes all the way to the bottom. It doesn't hop up behind the text. And we can do the same with grid layout. So I've got a grid on my wrapper element. I'm positioning my sidebar and my content using line-based positioning. So in all of these examples, this idea of things understanding their place in a wider layout, that's really important. For almost as long as I've been doing CSS layout, we've talked about separation of content from the display, of content and markup from the way it looks. That was kind of the rallying cry of the CSS for layout movement. We were trying to persuade our table using friends that they should start using this new shiny CSS layout rather than tables. But it's been something of a failed promise. We can usually have the ideal source order and one display, but once we start dealing with responsive and we're trying to deal with multiple displays of that content, it's very difficult to not start messing around with the source order in order to get the different kinds of displays that we want. So if we take a look at Flexbox, I've got my navigation here. It's very simply laid out uh, with Flexbox, and I'm using space between. So Flexbox is assigning the space left over after displaying the items. My flex direction property is set to row, and that's the initial behavior of Flexbox. You can also use column to display the items as a column. If I want to switch the order of flex items, I can set the flex direction property to row reverse, or we could use column reverse. We can also set the order using the order property. So I've got a bunch of items displaying in source order in a flex container, and I've given them all a number so we can see their DOM order. We can change the order. So now the source order number, three, uh, number one is now three visually. CSS Grid gives us the power to change the order of elements in not one, but two dimensions. So I've got a parent element here set to display grid, and I'm setting up a three-column grid. And I'm positioning these items using the CSS Grid layout, grid column, and grid row properties. The value before the forward slash is the, content, the line the content starts on, and the value after is the end line. And that lets us do something like this. So I'm positioning items around the grid, both in columns and in rows. The constraint is that grid items, like flex items, need to be a direct child of the element that has become a grid container. But there's more. So in addition to this placing of items on an explicit grid, grid layout also includes auto-placement rules. They let us take a chunk of content, hand it to a grid, and the grid will just display it for us. So in the previous example, if I remove all positioning information, I just declare a grid, uh, these items will be displayed by grid in source order, each in a grid cell. If I add some more images, and some of those images are landscape and some are portrait, so I'll add a class to any LI elements that contain landscape images. And I can then set the grid column end property to span two lines. So that means my landscape images now span two grid tracks and my portrait ones span the default one track. And so I get this. So sometimes, so for instance, we've got our first two items, we've got a portrait, then we've got one that takes two tracks, and then we've got a gap, because the next image is also landscape, it needs two tracks. So by default, grid is progressing forward. It's keeping the items in DOM order. Unless I add a property of grid auto flow with a value of dense. Grids will now backfill the gaps. It moves through the content, it finds an image that will fit a gap it already left, it will pick it up and it will pop it into the space. So you can see that item four now become, comes before item three in the visual display. This is incredibly powerful and also slightly scary. <laughs> so with this power become, comes great responsibility. Uh, these new methods give us an ability to separate you know, document order and display in ways we have never been able to do before. And we need to start having conversations about how we do this in an accessible way. Because ideally, they should make us able to create really great source documents and then get visual displays that work well for all our different devices. But... People may just think, well, I don't need to worry about source order anymore. This will work. Whatever I do, I can just drag things around the grid. That would be bad. Even worse, 
Because items only become grid items or flex items if they are a direct child of the container, I think there is a real danger that individuals writing web pages, authoring tools, or people making JavaScript frameworks will start to strip markup in order to make it easier and have a flatter source so it is easier to use these techniques. I think that's a real danger. I think it's something that we should be thinking about as a community as these new methods come into being. Uh, this is from the current Flexbox editor's draft, explaining that order does not change the logical order of the document. It's just for the visual display. So it appears that the hardest challenge in web design is vertical alignment. And this is something that our new layout methods solve. And here I'm going to bring a new player into the picture. We've talked about grid and Flexbox. This is the CSS box alignment module. It's a module that contains the features of CSS that relate to alignment. And it's basically, if you've played with Flexbox, it's the alignment capabilities of Flexbox brought out so they can apply to other layout methods. So this is the vertical <coughs> centering module, although it covers other things too, like distribution of space, overflows, logical positioning. So we've already seen distributed alignment. We saw one of the keyword values in the simple Flexbox example. In Flexbox, we use justify content and align content to align items against one of the two axes. I've got navigation in a row, and I use justify content with a keyword value of space between to line up my first and last items flush with the sides of the container and distribute the rest of the space equally. I can use space around, and an equal amount of space is then placed left and right of the items, so there's a kind of half size space on each end. By setting align or justify items on the flex container, we're actually changing the align self and justify self properties of each of the individual items inside. As you've already seen, items in a flex container have relationship. By default, the value of align items will be stretch, which means that our items stretch on the cross axis and are all the same height despite not containing content of the same height. My first navigation point there has got a bit of text in. Uh, the other things all know to go to the same height as that. Another problem solved with uh, one line of CSS is doing vertical centering. Set align items to center, and the items all center against the main axis. And if you switch flex direction to column, then align items center will center the items horizontally. Justify self and align self can be used on individual flex items to change their alignment properties. So here I've made the third item stretch rather than center. So we can get at individual items. So this works with Flexbox. You can start playing around with this. You know, you can be using this now. And ultimately, it's going to apply to all kinds of layout. And so this has started to be implemented in the grid spec, so we can have a look at how that's working in grid. So here I've created a grid, and I'm setting align items on the grid to center. And we've got a repeating pattern of grid tracks here, and I'm then positioning my items, each grid area spanning four lines horizontally and vertically. So each of the four grid areas covers four squares of the background image. You might be able to see that. There's also a link there. Um, by default, the item would actually stretch and fill the whole area. But because we've set align items to center, the items center within the area. And we can justify the items. Same grid, same placement. But this time, we get this kind of alignment. And just like with Flexbox, we've got the align self and justify self properties. And that lets you target individual grid items. And so you can really see how these properties work here. Box A is showing the default stretch to cover the grid area. Uh, B is set to align self end, C to align self start, and D to align self center. So we've got these powerful alignment capabilities, and we can start to use them already in Flexbox. They're coming to other layout methods. Ultimately, they may well apply to block layout methods, so we'll probably have you know, the ability to vertically center things on the web for the first time. And being able to align groups and individual items is really vital for responsive design because we don't know maybe how wide that viewport is. 
And it's where a lot of our hacks that kind of worked, you know, things like the, uh, the faux columns idea, is where they started to fall down once we didn't know how wide that column was going to be. And that's the thing with these new methods. They are essentially responsive by default. I'm sure everyone here knows that it was back in 2009 that Ethan Marcotte detailed in his A List Apart article this technique for creating fluid grids. He was working with relative font sizes and noted that grids could be treated in the same way, that we could divide the target width of an element by the width of the context to give us a percentage to use in place of absolute sizes for columns in a design. And so it came to pass that we all started calculating these unlikely looking numbers and sticking them in our layouts. But our new layout methods are going to allow us to retire a lot of those calculations because they kind of just do this stuff for us. We've already seen how the most simple of Flexbox examples takes a list of items, uh, declare display flex on them, and use justify content with a value of space between. That value flexes with the available space. You know, adds and removes space as needed. But there's more than that because Flexbox allows us to proportionately distribute space between our items. Now, the flex property is a shorthand for three properties. We've got flex grow, flex shrink, and flex basis. Uh, the Flexbox draft spec suggests we use the shorthand for these properties uh, because they will reset the other values to things that you know, make sense and are good common uses. Um, but I think there's quite a lot of confusion around how these things work. So here I'm setting flex grow and flex shrink to one. And that means that every box, every flex item can grow and shrink to fit into the space. But the ideal box width, my flex basis, is 200 pixels. And so this code applied to some items will give me three boxes of equal width. If I allow the items to wrap, we can drag the window smaller and see that when the boxes get smaller than 200 pixels, a box will wrap onto line two to try and maintain that 200 pixel basis. So the final box here is taking up all of the space on row two because alignment is worked out on a row by row basis. If the row only has one item, it's allowed to grow, so it will grow and it will fill all of the available space. If I don't want the boxes to grow, I set flex grow to zero which at a wide window size, my boxes will just stay at the 200 pixel. If you let the boxes wrap, the third item will still drop down, but it won't grow and fill the line. And you can target individual items too. So here I've added rules for box three. All boxes can grow and shrink from 200 pixels, but box three cannot grow. And so you see what happens. Once the boxes have to stretch wider than 200 pixels, it stays at 200 pixels, and the space that's remaining is distributed between the boxes that are allowed to grow. But there's more than this, because responsive design is about proportions. That's what all our percentages were about. So in order that we can maintain proportions as elements flex, we can assign different values to flex grow and flex shrink. So here I'm setting box three to flex grow two with my other two boxes at their default of flex one. What this doesn't mean is that box three becomes twice the size of the other boxes. It means that after the 200 pixel basis has been taken away from the available width in the container, the rest of the space is assigned to each item according to that flex grow factor. And if that sounds very confusing, a good way to figure it all out is there's this Flexbox tester tool. You can stick in a load of values, and it will tell you what you would come out with. And uh, once you've started playing around with it, it starts to make sense, really. And once you understand that, you have got a head start to understand the CSS Grid Layout FR unit. This is a fraction unit. And like Flex Grow, it allows you to assign a fraction of the available space. So let's take a quick look at this. So here's my simple grid. It defines three columns, all with one FR as the width. So that creates three equal width columns. If I change my definition and create a 600 pixel width column, so an absolute sized column, and then two one fraction unit columns, grid first gives the fixed width element, it's 600 pixels, the remaining space, it divides into two, and it gives half of its one column, half to the other. <coughs> 
If I change that last column to 3FR, the remaining space should be divided into four. Three parts is given to the, the 3FR and one part given to the 1FR. This, just like Flexbox, means that we can create fully flexible layouts that have some fixed width elements in them. And this is just like the holy grail layout that we used to try and build. This was fixed sidebars with a liquid center where the center column could be first in the source order but would flex according to screen width. And so there, like this. Uh, if you've not seen this syntax before, this is the CSS grid layout, ASCII art layout, or grid template areas. Uh, that CSS gives you um, a layout and the center column is set to one fraction unit, so that will stretch and take up all of the available width, and it will look something like this, which is a good 2005-era layout. It's not what we're all aiming to build these days, but I feel that given the history, it's nice to know that we can finally do it. <laughs> so, it's a new system for layout. I think it raises a huge amount of, of different possibilities, and I'm sort of very excited to see what happens as it gets into the hands of people who are creative with this stuff, rather than people like me who can just build things. Um, we've got grid, we've got flexbox, and then that's tied together with the alignment and space distribution properties from box alignment. The key difference between these two specs, uh, people often say, oh, well, which should I be using? Should I use, in an ideal world, once we've got them both, would I be using flexbox or would I use grid? So flexbox is for one dimensional layout. That's things that can be laid out in a row or laid out in a column. Um, although it wraps, essentially you've still got an unbroken line. Grid is for two-dimensional layout, so you're working with rows and columns. Uh, so the simplest example of this, if we wrap a set of items using Flexbox, so I've got a flex basis here of 200 pixels and the items are allowed to grow and shrink. And if I've got five items, what happens here? The flex items wrap. So each row starts acting like a new flex container and space distribution happens across the row because that's how it works. So at the top line, we've got three items and then we go to the next line, we've only got two items, they're allowed to grow, so it splits the difference and they spread out across there. And then people say, oh, well actually what I'd like to be able to do is line up those two bottom items underneath the items at the top. And Flexbox doesn't do this because it's dealing with this sort of unbroken line. This is where you want grid layout if you want to do something like this because you're wanting to control both the rows and the columns. And so with grid layout, you'd do something like this. So you wouldn't need to do anything with the items. It'd all be controlled when you're creating the grid um, and then the items would be flown in, flowed into it and that would give you this kind of layout. So unless you actually explicitly said to something, I want you to span across two of the column tracks, you'd get them in single tracks. So when can we use all this wonderful new goodness? Well, so Flexbox has actually got really great browser support at this point. If you can use new browsers, you can pretty happily use Flexbox. Even if you have to support old browsers, it's very possible to use quite a lot of Flexbox as essentially an enhancement to your layout. So use older methods and then really tweak the alignment and get things to look really tight using Flexbox. But really everyone should probably be starting to use some degree of Flexbox in their work at this point um, because it's, it's got really good support. Um, it's worth doing. So browser support for grid layout, not so good. The only browser that has any implementation which is sort of live is i10, i11, and Edge. And that is because this spec came from Microsoft and they created an early implementation of it. It's in those browsers. Um, but it's, it's actually quite different now to the, the current specification because it was essentially the very first implementation of the spec. Uh, the, probably the best stuff to work with is in Chrome, in regular Chrome, uh, but it's behind a flag. So you need to enable the experimental web platform features flag and then lots of demos, all the things that I've shown you today, you can have a look at them and play around with them. Um, that work in Blink, so it's in Chrome and Opera, is being done by Egalia. Um, sponsored by Bloomberg. They're also doing the work in WebKit, and WebKit nightlies have grid layout enabled. You need to use a WebKit prefix. 
Grids on the edge backlog um, at high priority, so I'm assuming they're intending to bring their implementation up to the same spec with everything else. And Mozilla are currently implementing Grid in Firefox. Quite a lot of these examples work in Firefox Nightlies. Um, and there's also a polyfill out there. So Grid is coming, and unlike Flexbox, which kind of trickled out in kind of half-broken states and changed and got us all really confused, um, Grid's been developed behind flags. So when it does eventually ship in browsers, it should be fairly equal across browsers and very complete. And it's being kind of kept behind a flag so that we don't have this problem of it emerging in bits, um, which is good news for us because it means when it does arrive, we can start using it with some confidence uh, if we've got newer browsers to use it with. I have lots and lots of grid examples to, for people to play with. If you want to toggle a flag in your browser, go and have a look. Uh, this is gridbyexample.com. It's where I keep all of my grid examples. I keep putting new ones up there. And I'd love to have more people looking at this stuff, and particularly if you've got an interest in accessibility. It's not my area of expertise. And I'd love to see more conversations happening around you know, using these new layout methods and accessibility, because I think it's a really, really important subject. Um, I have got a um, office hours thing at lunch, so very happy to have a chat about any of this stuff there. And you will find my slides, all the code examples of that URL, and you can always tweet at me on Twitter uh, or drop me a line. I love talking about this stuff. Thank you very much for listening.